OK, another, another new thing to talk about is Wolfram script. Um, so Wolfram script is a command line way of, uh, of interacting with Wolfram language. So you can say, so you can either use it locally on your machine, or you can say, run it in the cloud. So I can show you that if we go back to the same terminal window I was doing this with. We can say Wolfram script um, dash cloud dash code, let's say 100 factorial. Okay, so what this will now do is it will run as a command line program. It will run, it will take 100 factorial, it will send it to the cloud, it's been authenticated, it will send back the results. So that's a useful thing if you're building this into a script that um, uh, in a large system. You can also take that, let me show you, um, uh, you can also do that um, with, uh, uh, you can create kind of a shell function um, and, uh, you can, um, uh, where, where you can then call it with, with, um, uh, with arguments in the shell, and you can basically use the same mechanism that you use for, um, uh, it probably has examples here. Um, you can use the same mechanism, basically, that you create an API. So here we're creating a, um, uh, uh, a Wolfram script function with signature city city that computes the distance between two cities. And we can now deploy that as a command line thing. And then we give the, on the command line, we give these two cities and it will return to the, um, uh, directly to the shell the, um, uh, the result. Okay, so there are lots of different ways to integrate Wolfram language into, into things. It's a, you can, if you look at this, a kind of horrendously complicated page of, of the ways that that you can integrate the Wolfram engine either sort of inside your other application or as the shell outside an application. There are a lot of different forms of deployment that exist. Um, but uh, so one thing that, um, let, let's talk about external languages. So one, one big thing that's come in version 11.2 is the ability to, um, uh, let's go here, is the ability to, um, uh, actually send computations directly from within Wolfram language to external programs, and that's not a good sign. Uh, that's really odd. Um, let's try this again. No. Let's try it again. Hmm. Well, that is odd. Let me try one thing here. Let's try doing, I've got one more idea for how I might make that work. Let's try here. And let's try, let's just try external evaluate in Python um, of, let's say, 34 to the power 5 or something. Oh, I want that in a string, though, probably. 34 to the power 5. Um, and wake up. Oh, it uses, it's an exclusive OR operator, I bet. Python doesn't, Python uses wedge as an exclusive OR operator. OK, well, anyway, let's, let's, but uh, in any case, what this is doing is it's running that computation from this string. It's running that uh, as a, effectively through a Python REPL to get the results. So this is a way that you can immediately integrate Python code into, into Wolfram language. Um, and uh, it's a very kind of lightweight way to do that. OK, so. Uh, and what, what's non-trivial about it is being able to do all the type conversions and so on for things that are coming back from, from the computation. OK, and we, we have right now in 11.2, we support Python and JavaScript. Lots of other languages are coming. Um, and it's, it's kind of a way what, what we will be doing in the future is supporting not just a REPL where you're using an interactive language, but also external function, which calls directly into functions in external languages, which allows one to deal with languages that can't have REPLs. Um, and that's kind of a, a more streamlined and lightweight way to do what we can currently do with WSTP and with library link and so on. OK, well, let me show you something. Now, now I've shown you a bunch of things that exist in version 11.2. Let me now jump to the sort of the future and talk about um, what, what is possible in um, uh, what will be possible in future versions. So here's a, here's a cool thing. We can, um, if you just type, if you type an equal sign at the beginning of a line, you get a Wolfram Alpha cell. If you type a greater than sign at the beginning of the line, you get an external language cell. And so this right now, I'd set it to default to Python. Uh, it right now just lies Python and Node.js. But now I could type in my, um, I wonder what it does like this. If uh, I could type that in, and now I just compute that. And now that's Python input generating Wolfram language output. 
Um, and I could just have pasted in some great big long Python program here right into my notebook, and I can be using the notebook environment um, to deal with external uh, languages. So, uh, and, and there are lots of, so there'll be lots of convenient things coming of different versions of languages with all sorts of libraries pre-installed and so on. Okay, well, you, you, this kind of thing, uh, we, we're not going to let you do this in our public cloud to use external languages because it doesn't, the, the sandbox of our public cloud won't, won't allow that. Um, but if you have a private cloud, um, you will be able to do this kind of thing. And this sort of brings me to talking about private clouds. So um, uh, the thing that, um, let's, let's take a look here. Uh, so as, as many of you uh, may know, um, in addition to our public cloud, we also support um, private clouds that run in virtual machines. Um, and uh, when you get a private cloud, this is the thing that you get that allows you to set up your private cloud. This is the private cloud, enterprise private cloud configuration notebook. You get some kind of sense of what's involved in setting up a private cloud. So there's the base domain, there's all kinds of nodes, web subdomains. It's a little bit complicated. It's, it's, uh, I mean, you, you can hit default for everything, but that's probably not what you want. That's setting up mail, that's setting up accounts for your users, setting up various things of databases that are used inside it, setting up various things to do with the way the, the kernel pools work in the cloud, how the kernel is initialized, what kind of limits there should be on the computations, all this kind of thing. Security of Wolfram Engine, how the sandbox works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whether you will allow people to run external code, uh, what the branding should look like, all these kinds of things. But what's neat is, you know, once you go through this notebook, at the end of the notebook, you basically just press go. You generate the configuration files, install them in the virtual machine, restart system services, and there you have a completely configured private cloud um, that uh, will run in your corporate environment. Um, and uh, this is, uh, we've been steadily streamlining this and working with lots of customers, including some who are here, um, to build out different configurations of the private cloud with various kinds of elastic uh, versions and so on. But it's, it's now become a quite streamlined thing that just arrives as a big virtual machine. Um, one thing that is new here, oh, I might mention for private clouds, one thing that's coming, yeah, one, one big thing about private clouds is um, uh, that we are, uh, you can kind of cut away a lot of the overhead that exists in the public cloud. So, for example, if you remove authentication, you remove HTTPS layers, things like that, uh, you, can, you can make it faster and faster. So right now, the big, the big test for us is what's the time for a minimal API call? The answer right now is 51 milliseconds. Um, that will decrease uh, somewhat further. Um, actually, we have a, another product that is coming called Wolfram Engine for web servers, which is for people who are, who are really wanting to work right down at the kind of bare metal. It's kind of the successor to Web Mathematica. It has no user authentication, no cloud object system, uh, none of the kind of uh, structure, just raw files. And that we one can expect to do an API call in maybe 20 milliseconds or below. It's worth remembering that HTTPS uh, um, um, Handshakes take about 100 milliseconds, so that's, that dwarfs the time that it's taking to do um, uh, to do these uh, uh, these actual API calls now in our in our cloud. Um, uh, talking about API calls, one of the one of the things that's important about a private cloud is if you are running an API in a private cloud and the API has a lot of initialization it has to do, um, you can always have a kernel that has the all that initialization pre-done. So when the API needs to be called, it can immediately operate. One thing that's coming uh, that we actually have, have working now, again, it's a slightly sophisticated thing, is kernel forking so that you can actually take the running kernel process after initialization and fork it. Um, and then you have a forked process that will restart um, and not use extra, not use the, the not reuse memory and so on um, when, when the forked process starts. And, and for us, it's really important for operating our public cloud, but it's also, it's also really important for Wolfram Alpha um, to be able to use forked kernels like that. It's also important for security and other purposes. Something else that's coming in private clouds, the cloud, the cloud connector for Excel. Um, being able to go into Excel and sort of immediately call Wolfram language functions um, in a private cloud from within Excel. Another thing that's coming is our uh, um, HPC um, cloud. So this is something that, let me see if I can show you one quick example of that. Oh, don't tell me I don't have that. Um, uh, let's see, maybe this is it. Let's see. Um, 
So this is now a, OK, so this is now going to a test cluster that is running. Great. It doesn't. OK, well, I'll tell you what that you would have seen if it had gone there. That's a private cloud that's been configured with multiple cores, um, multiple machines, um, and it is running parallel computation in, in the cloud um, so that I can use all of the parallel computation capabilities of Wolfram Language um, in this private cloud. Um, and so that's a, and so we expect there'll be service providers that um, will set up large um, parallel computation clouds um, that you can access, for example, directly from the desktop and just say, okay, I want to run in a, in a, a thousand kernels um, this particular computation. We now have the infrastructure to do that. Okay, so, uh, gosh, so many things to talk about. Um, it's, uh, um, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of things related to, so we have a general mechanism we call Kernel Connection Manager, which is a way of managing uh, machines that, uh, possible kernels that you can run. So an example of that is Remote Evaluate. Uh, you can use Remote Evaluate if you have a network of Raspberry Pis or something. Each one has a name. You can just call Remote Evaluate to run current image or something on each of those Raspberry Pis. There's also a Remote Run function that uses SSH. Um, another thing that's coming um, is uh, genuine standalone apps from Wolfram Language. So this is an example of deploying a standalone app to, um, uh, through Wolfram Script. Um, and that app, we can now we could now just run that app on the command line. This is a, essentially a, a Wolfram Script API function, a shell API function um, that's been created here that we can run on the command line. The really interesting thing about this is you'll be able to deploy apps that start user interfaces as well as um, just doing computations. So you'll be able to say, bring up a notebook, make it full screen. It's this notebook. It has these menu configurations. So you'll be able to have something where just from the command line, effectively, you are running directly a, a full Wolfram Language backed app. Um, so let's see. Gosh, I have, I have an awful lot to talk about here. Let's try and speed up a little bit. Um, so for that kind of standalone deployment, things that are coming, continuous tasks. So you can have a Raspberry Pi that's just continually running a computation um, and responding to, to inputs. Um, and it will restart if the thing reboots and so on. There's also a triggered task, which allows you, upon some trigger that comes through a channel in the channel framework, um, perform a task. Um, other things for sort of embedded computation, uh, we now have as a, as a developer product um, the ability to support Linux ARM systems other than Raspberry Pi. We've actually had Android kernels for a long time, although not officially released. And now we have the system on iOS. Um, another thing of interest to some people, we now have a headless front end running under Linux. So in the past, when you've had to create uh, images, rasterized output, you have to be somewhere running a Windows system. That's no longer the case. Um, another kind of external interaction that's coming is mail search. So being able to connect to uh, a mail server and being able to treat your mail as kind of a set of symbolic objects that you can search or do computations, delete, um, uh, process in various ways. Uh, it's kind of complementary to the thing we've had for a while, mail receiver function, which is kind of the, the API function that is activated by sending mail to a particular address. Mentioning search, another thing that's happened is text search has gotten a lot stronger. It's really quite an industrial grade uh, search system at this point. Uh, there's kind of this pipeline of going from the original document, extracting features, indexing, using signals to feed to ranking functions and so on. It's something where we can make use of a lot of our machine learning capabilities to do that, uh, to do that very well. Uh, we actually just started using our own text search for our documentation search. Soon it will be running um, on our whole uh, website. Um, it will also be running in the, um, uh, in the cloud to search uh, files that people um, have been storing in the cloud. Uh, we also soon will be bringing out a web crawl functionality um, for crawling large websites and cr crawling the web in general. Um, something that, um, new topic. So I talk about the thing we call the resource system. It's a way of storing stuff sort of persistent stuff in the cloud with metadata and convenient access. So people may know of our data drop, which is a way of incrementally adding data to data bins. Um, the, uh, this April, we released our um, uh, data repository. And uh, 
me just bring that up. Um, so the data repository is um, uh, it's something I've been sort of wanting to make for a decade, um, a place where people can put data and make it actually useful. Um, the, uh, you know, it's very common to find some uh, you know, paper which says, and our data is available from blah, blah, blah. You actually go there, and it doesn't actually work. So the goal of our data repository is to have a place where people can publish data and have it actually be useful. Um, and so that's really been made possible. We have, this, have to have a big stack of technology to make that work, to really enable this sort of data back publication. We need this whole data ontology, um, and we need to be able to put things into a, a useful form. And I mean, if, if we actually go here, we'll go, this is a particular piece of data. We could say, pick up that data. Let's go here. This is now um, going to load in the data from that particular uh, resource. This is about meteorite landings. Maybe I could take a uh, random sample of, uh, of 500 of those and let me take um, their coordinates. Um, and now I'll be just getting this data, get a bunch of coordinates there. Maybe I could do a geolist plot, find out where those meteorites landed, um, and there we get the result. And this all just works. We were able to just take this data in, start processing it. We got about 600 um, entries in the data repository so far. Uh, we hope people, including people here, will contribute a lot more entries to the data repository. Um, it's uh, this kind of a, um, a sort of a story behind, um, uh, let's see, the, the um, sort of the question of, OK, so when, when, you, when you make one of these data repository entries, you can actually, here, let me, let me just show you how you create a, a new entry in the data repository. We just go to File, New, and it says Data Resource. And we'll then get this big thing that you fill out that specifies how the data resource is going to be set up. Um, it's not very difficult to fill this out. Um, the, uh, and then when you press go, you can either deploy it to um, uh, submit it as a new resource. Um, and so you can actually deploy it as a private data resource for yourself uh, living in the cloud. Um, and you can access it uh, yourself. Or you can say, I want to actually submit it to be um, as a public data resource. So you can say resource submit. That will get sent to us. And we will do some curation and, um, and then publish that data resource. Um, and then the, uh, uh, so, so a way to think about this, the way I've kind of thought about this, is there's, some, uh, there's kind of a hierarchy of um, levels of, um, of data curation that you need to go through. It goes from sort of the data is in digital form to things like, things like uh, dates and coordinates or so on are, are in canonical form to things where more sophisticated entities are in canonical form, eventually to where you get something that is suitable for really smooth operation um, as an integrated part of Wolfram language. But the idea of data repository is if you get to about level five on here, um, you will have something that is really useful in the data repository. And the idea is that if you know your data and you know Wolfram language, it should take you only about half an hour to get your data to this level five in this hierarchy and to be able to submit it to the data repository. And there's kind of a, uh, there's this whole sort of art of data curation that we're interested in. We've been trying to uh, uh, work on creating kind of a certified um, uh, data uh, curator program. And we've been, um, uh, we've been doing things in this kind of towards this art of data curation. Here are a few um, uh, um, live uh, um, videos of uh, showing th uh, things about data curation. OK. so. Uh, one thing to say about the data repository, it's a completely open thing. So you can, if, you, if something is published there, you can freely download it in JSON, Excel format, whatever. Uh, it's typically more useful in Wolfram language format, but the idea is to, make, to have it be a public resource where people can publish data. OK, so for example, I've been, um, I've been putting lots of sort of the backup material from New Kind of Science um, in there. So for instance, if, I, if you take a particular page, and so the typical workflow will be you look at a page in a paper. The page in the paper, this happens to be my, my uh, new kind of science book. The page will have a link to a notebook. Um, that notebook will then link to a data repository entry. So here's one that links from that page there. And then you can just go and do computations based on uh, the material that was in the paper. OK, one thing that. Uh, I mentioned is uh, the notion of entity stores. So not only can one have 
data sets, that's a common way of um, representing data. There are also entity stores. An entity store is a more sophisticated form of um, a uh, more sophisticated way to deal with um, data. So it's something for our in-house, for our in internal curated data. This is now asking for um, uh, the populations of the 10 most populous, the, the, the 10 most populous cities in the world. That's using essentially entity store syntax. Now we can we can go to our data repository. Here's an entity store of books in my library, as it turns out. Um, and so we can go and. Um, and make use of that uh, of that entity store here. So there's the entity store represented like that. We have to tell it we want to add this to our list of entity stores. Now we can say, for example, how many books are there in my library? Okay, that's less than I thought actually. But um, uh, the um, okay, so we can say what properties do we know about those books? So we could say, for example, um, what is this? This is doing some computation about um, making a histogram of dates of uh, publication years, I guess, of um, of books in my, in my library. So, so that's an example of how entity stores work. Um, it's sort of a more a richer way of representing data. Well, so one of the things that we're also dealing with is external databases. So this is dealing with data that's directly in Wolfram language. Um, something that's coming is much richer integration of external databases. So we've had database link for a long time. This is now truly true integration of, of external databases. So let's connect to an external database here. Um, this, is, uh, um, this is actually our bugs database that I connected to, which is a MySQL database. We have a, now a highly optimized um, mechanism for generating queries. It'll take a little while to warm itself up here um, to get ready to, to deal with a new data, database. But now what I should be able to do, let me, let me get this ready, I should be able to do things like count the number of closed bugs. Let's, let's wait for this to, um, it'll just take a little while to, to get all of its, um, compile all of its connectivity and so on information. But then what I should be able to do is to start doing computations. OK, there we go. So now let's count the number of closed bugs, 217,000 closed bugs in our database. Let's look at the properties of closed bugs. OK, those are properties in the, in the tables that represent in our MySQL database. So this is, this is completely uh, determined from the MySQL database. There's no, there's no connector other than just specifying how to get to that database. So for example, I could say, let's look at open bugs. Let's look at a summary of the uh, top thousand, first thousand uh, open bugs. I could say, for example, I could ask, and now, I, now I'm seeing what I'm starting to see here is this entity store syntax. So this is now asking for the entity value um, of a uh, let's make let's make a data set out of that. Um, this is now asking for bugs reported by me um, as a function of time. So this is in version two. This is a particular bug there. Okay, there are 39 of these bugs in version two reported by me. We can go through and look at them. So this is this is what it's going to start to look like when you do. Uh, this is what a pretty sophisticated SQL query. Uh, this turns into underneath. It's compiled into an SQL query that's optimized for the particular database that is the underlying database. But now, at a symbolic level in Wolfram language, you can write arbitrarily complex database queries and execute them against an external database. Um, so that's a that's a that's a, a neat coming attraction. Um, another thing. So there are different different kinds of databases. Here's another one we're supporting: is Sparkle databases, um, triple stores. So this is. Um, uh, let me see. I've got, um, uh, let's, let's do something in a triple store here. So this is an in memory. I'm just going to create a triple store here in memory uh, with 43 triples. And now I could, for example, ask for, I, can, I have a function graph cases, which is kind of integrated with our pattern language. And it's asking in this graph, what are instances of things which go from compound to disease? This is some kind of medical um, data, data set uh, in, in four steps. And this is then giving the result. So it's kind of matching things on this graph database. I could also do the same thing with an external database. This is taking a, um, a wiki data external Sparkle endpoint. And now I'm running a computation on that external Sparkle endpoint. OK, I mentioned before. The, um, the neural net repository, that's just an example of another thing that is, so I, I should mention that in addition to things like Sparkle, there's also support for Mongo and S3 and, and things like this. Um, OK, so resource system, uh, there are, we have now have a general framework 
for creating these resource systems. There are many that are coming. Uh, I mentioned the data repository, mentioned the neural net repository. One that's coming next is our function repository. And the idea there, I hope it will be useful to many people here, the idea there is to be able to basically put functions um, into the cloud for anybody to be able to use. And let me show you roughly how that works. Um, you will be able to have a resource object that's named just like in the data repository. So there's a gray code function that has been put in the function repository. Now we can have a resource function. That resource function will look like that. And now we can take that resource function and, for example, apply it to some argument. And now it'll run the code that it got from the cloud and run that locally. And this is a way of being able to have a large library of, of additional functions that can be defined. Um, in addition to the function repository, another one that's coming is the formula repository. Um, this is something where it's, uh, uh, let me show you an example. So the formula repository actually has on, on the shingles in the cloud, here's one for Ohm's law. There's actually, you can actually do the computation right there in the cloud. Um, this is something for representing formulas which typically have a few named parameters and get a result. Um, Another thing that's becoming part of the resource system is the demonstrations project. So the demonstrations project with its 11,000 demonstrations, um, each one of those demonstrations becomes a resource object. So this is just a, a, a re-implementation. This is a new look for the demonstrations project that involves, um, uh, that, that involves um, um, uh, that has demonstrations that can be run directly in the cloud. Um, but this is now a, um, a resource object from the demonstrations project. So this is now taking the object, taking that, that demonstration and having it so it's directly loadable into Wolfram Language as a piece of computable data. So it's a very convenient way to make use of the demonstrations project. OK, I'm, I'm rushing here. Um, I'm going to show you a few more things, a bunch more things. I, I, so this is now uh, some sort of research that we're doing on, I'm, I'm changing topics now. I'm talking about, actually, I should mention there are other, before I say that, I should mention there are other repositories that are coming. Um, there will be a, uh, an API repository, um, and uh, uh, among other things, which will allow you to, uh, among other things, sell APIs sell access to APIs. Actually, you'll be able to sell functions as well. Um, that's a complicated story of authentication and so on. Uh, we ourselves will have a library of what we call dead simple APIs um, that will be in sort of immediate access to specific functions within the Wolfram language. OK, so here I have a sample data set about the Titanic. Let me show you something that, um, oh gosh, I should have started this. Um, let me show you something here that um, uh, that we are working towards being able to do, which is natural language queries of data sets. Um, so this is a particular data set that has a few names of, of things here, um, and we're telling it that, um, okay, that we've got passengers that we're dealing with here. So now we can make a semantic query against this semantic data set, and we can say, give us older than 70 males. And I could, I could put in all kinds of different natural language here, and it's leveraging our natural language understanding stack to be able to do database queries and data set queries um, using natural language. So that's kind of a, uh, uh, a nice thing that's, that's coming. Uh, that's sort of a junior version of what we've been doing for a while uh, that's a very, a very serious big, big thing, which is enterprise versions of Wolfram Alpha. And um, so the, um, uh, we have built uh, custom versions of Wolfram Alpha for a bunch of large organizations. Uh, quite a few of them are running in production right now uh, inside systems that a lot of people use in the world. Um, some people here I know from companies that, that uh, uh, make use of that. Um, actually, our, our enterprise Wolfram Alpha uh, business is a separate business unit now. Uh, now. I won't talk about it in, in great detail here, but it's a terrific application of Wolfram language um, and kind of a sign of what can be done. Um, there's a, the typical use case, the most common ca case is to build, uh, the most common situation is CEO of large company X sees Wolfram Alpha and says, I wish I could do something similar with my internal data, whatever that is, of doing natural language uh, input and being able to generate reports based on internal data. So for the last several years, we've been building such systems, custom versions of Wolfram Alpha um, for companies that typically combine their internal uh, proprietary data with public data um, to, to 
uh, come up with useful conclusions. One of the things that happens, I think, I think Wolfram Alpha, Enterprise Wolfram Alpha is kind of the, 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 the best example of enterprise AI that actually works. Um, I mean, typically uh, in, in companies, things have been optimized to the point where there is a, the data is quite structured, but what's, a, and what's not so structured is the questions you ask about that data, and that's what we're really supporting with Enterprise Wolfram Alpha. So there'll be a bunch of announcements actually soon about Enterprise Wolfram Alpha, um, about deployments and partnerships and so on. Eventually, the, the Enterprise Wolfram Alpha business will soak up an infinite number of certified data curators, but that's, uh, that's a different story. So, Okay, I, I won't talk about consumer wolf mouth very much, um, except to say that uh, it's gotten faster and gotten to do more things. Um, we've got a, a lot of new APIs that are for wolf Alpha um, that are convenient for deploying it. Um, a bunch of uh, bunch of different ways of having very very simple to use APIs for wolf Alpha, including a new one, conversational API. Um, there's also another thing that's happening is we are getting. Uh, foreign language versions of Wolfram Alpha. We've actually had a Chinese version of Wolfram Alpha for a number of years, but for very tiresome regulatory reasons, we have been unable to deploy it. Um, but uh, now we have, I, I can't type the actual input for this, but um, uh, this is a Japanese version of Wolfram Alpha that will be coming out soon. It will also be coming out in several other languages. We're at least initially emphasizing the math component of Wolfram Alpha uh, to support students in, in different countries. Um, this, is, this is the one in Japanese. Um, be more exciting if I could type Japanese input, but I can't. Um, the, uh, so, okay, so then um, let's see. Uh, well, lots, a lot of other things happening. Lots of new machine learning things, learning distributions, lots of, uh, lots of things there. Let me, let me show you one example of a coming attraction in, um, uh, in machine learning. Let me go ahead and get the, uh, the beginning of the article about rhinoceroses from Wikipedia. And now what I can do, this is a new function that's coming, is it's a question answering function. So given that piece of text, answer the question, what is a rhinoceros horn made of? And um, this one, I think, is going to work because I tried it before. Um, and uh, this um, it should work faster than that. But anyway, it's, it's, um, it's trying to, OK. So it told us, based on, based on that passage of text, it said it figured out that um, a rhinoceros horn is made of keratin, which I think is correct. Let's ask it what the top three things it thought a rhinoceros horn might be made of. And well, that's not quite as convincing. Um, but uh, those are the things that it picked out from the natural language, from that small chunk of natural language that it picked out as the possible answer to our rhinoceros horn is made of X. Um, but this is, again, another application of machine learning. It's using uh, lots of, uh, it's, it's used a large data set that it's learnt kind of the patterns of English from um, to be able to do that. OK. So uh, another thing that's happening is um, being able to uh, do very large-scale machine learning training um, using AWS and using Mongo and so on, being able to do huge terabyte training sets and so on, and having a good workflow for doing things like that. I might mention that something we've really been looking at uh, um, is how to document workflows. We, we document functions in Wolfram language, but how do you document a workflow that goes between where you're typing something on your desktop computer, and then you go and you type something in, you know, into a, uh, something in AWS, and then you do this, and then you do that. So we have a new form of documentation that will be arriving actually in the next few weeks, um, which is workflow documentation. And this is kind of, this is a typical sort of workflow documentation that looks something like this. Typically, there'll be a tab at the top that says, what does it look like on the cloud? What does it look like in mobile? And so on. So this is a new form of documentation that's convenient for documenting these workflow processes that aren't just type this function, get this result. Um, it's, uh, it sort of allows us to, um, uh, to, to document a complete workflow that involves uh, multiple systems and so on. OK. Here's something, uh, something we can do with that. Let me show you very quickly. I'm, I'm really, um, this is a, a link to Unity. So Unity game engine. So I can go ahead here. This, this is something that would typically be documented in a workflow, how to do this. This should be opening Unity here. Let's go ahead and open it. Um, and oh, come on. Let's, OK, now we start it. This will be part of the workflow telling us what to do in Unity. OK, so now we create a new project in Unity. And then we can say, uh, that's going to just create a project here. OK, that's Unity starting up. Um, 
and then, okay, 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 very good. Right, so there's our project in Unity, and now we can go ahead here in Wolfram Language and we can say, for example, uh, create a Unity game object, so put a sphere into that Unity scene. So there we go, there's the Unity game object represented in Wolfram Language, and now if we look here, oops, there's a sphere that appears in the Unity, um, in the Unity game. Okay, so now if we wanted to, we could be a little bit fancier. We could say, let's get a Menger sponge. Let's put that in the Unity game. Um, then let's say, um, okay, let's put that in the Unity game here. Um, and um, then there's the, there's the game object in, um, in Wolfram Language. Uh, there it is now in the game. And we could go ahead and, and give physics to these things and have them bounce around in the game. And we can, you can think of Unity as being kind of a, a, an, a live uh, form of interface to a lot of what happens in Wolfram Language, if you, if you want to use it that way, sort of the game interface to Wolfram Language. Okay, another thing uh, related to this that we're doing is System Modeler, a, a long-standing product of ours, is um, uh, uh, we are deeply integrating that with Wolfram Language, and so that will allow us to represent uh, sort of a new class of things in the language, that is devices and machines, that's not a good sign. Maybe I have to actually start System Modeler to make this work. Um, so let's see. I think right now maybe I have to start System Modeler. I shouldn't have to start this. Okay, let's, um, let's go here. Let's try that again. Um, so what I should get, that's even worse. Uh, okay, anybody got a good idea how to make this work? Or do we just move on? What's that? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, it didn't work. Okay, that's a shame. Well, what I could have shown you is representing devices and systems, engineering systems and so on, directly in Wolfram Language as symbolic objects and being able to manipulate them and do computations with them. So it's kind of a, a new area uh, for, um, uh, uh, for us to compute with. Okay, um, another... Another direction, I'll talk very quickly about user interface kinds of things. One of the big emphases we've had is on user assistance. That is, how can you make it easy for people to type in correct things and uh, easy to show people when they're making a mistake? So here, for example, notice that, uh, that time sign that appeared at the end of the line. That's probably a mistake, but it's telling you that this is going to be interpreted as 8 times 9. Or, for example, if I type something like this, again, we'll get a time sign in the middle of those. You probably wanted a comma there, but it's kind of reminding you that actually this really is going to be treated like multiplication. So we've got a lot of things like this that we've been steadily adding to make it easier, along with syntax coloring and auto-completion and so on, to make it easier to type correct code. Here's another thing. This is something convenient in using notebooks, a function called iconize. So this is a way of just putting a bunch of data into a notebook. So here I just have this data, and I can say, show me the length of this or something. Um, and this is just a way of representing, this is just a, a list of a million elements, just represented by that blob. And that's a convenient thing to store in your notebook, that blob, so you don't have to, you can put all the data in your notebook, but you don't get to see, you don't have to see the whole, the whole million elements there. Okay, so in addition to new user interface in, in, um, uh, in the desktop, there's also a new user interface in the cloud. Um, so here, for example, I can show you this is, um, this is a nice new, um, uh, this is coming actually very soon. Um, this is the nice, nice new file browser in the cloud um, that allows one to do all kinds of good things here. We've got all sorts of nice options and you can drag this thing around. It's a, it's a very beautiful file browser. We have sort of different constraints um, because on, on the desktop, we don't need to build our own file browser because that already comes with the operating system. In the cloud, we have to build our own file browser. And this is it, and it's, it's, uh, it's nice. Okay, so another thing that's coming is the ability to build kind of complete uh, applications, complete web applications directly from the language, um, both kind of a panel language for specifying all the different panels and making it so that that whole... Uh, that whole user interface I just showed you could be written just in symbolic top-level Wolfram language code. Um, part of what's necessary for that is a thing we call interface switched, which is an interface wrapper that allows for responsive design and that makes use of knowing what, what the environment in which something finds itself is. And it can be compiled into pure CSS for the web and so on. Um, OK, another big new thing is... Uh, um, Presenter tools. So let me try and show you that. So this is a um, uh, this is now 
a way of creating presentations that really work nicely in, um, uh, in notebooks and so on. So you can pick your theme. You can pick your theming colors. I don't know. Let's pick that one. You can pick your, your default fonts. And you say, OK, create a, um, uh, create a presentation. OK, so I, I have sort of sample co content in this presentation. Once I've got the content that I want, I could start, you know, I could start editing this content. I could put in a, you know, a title, a new title here. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I can say, start the presentation. And now it'll go to full screen. And I'm ready to roll. And I can do what I want to do here. And I'm just, um, uh, I'm, I can set what the keys I want to use to, um, um, uh, to, to, uh, to do my, my computations. But unlike something like PowerPoint, um, this is a live thing that you can actually type into and do computations with and so on. So I'll show you one example of that. This was a, um, uh, this was a thing that I just, uh, actually, this last weekend, indulging my hobby of um, history of science, I happened to be at a conference. Um, um, and I, I made up very quickly this, um, um, this uh, presentation. And now I've got, I've got this presentation. It's got a manipulate in it. And I can run there. I can do computations here. Um, and I've got something. But now I can go to the next slide if I want to. Here's the next slide, whatever it might be. What is this next slide? And it should be running. What is it doing? The, let's find out what the, very, what the next slide is. OK, that was the next slide. Um, just some images. But of course, this is all still an active. Uh, notebook here. So I can, if I want to make the images bigger for people, I can do that, and so on. But this is still kind of all kind of PowerPoint style in terms of being able to, um, uh, to walk through it. But then, then there's a manipulate, and you can, you can actually, it's, it's an active thing, and, and so on. So this is, this is our new um, uh, presenter tools uh, system um, that we think will be really useful for people to, um, uh, to present with Wolfram Language. Um, Let's see. Another new thing is our chat system. So here, uh, let's see. I can say new chat. And I should be able to have a chat window that comes up, I hope. Um, this is now a, a, a sort of a, a chat that anybody can connect to. That's a really bad sign. Um, that's a really bad sign. The, um, well, who knows? Yeah, I can try one. I'll try one more version here. Um, oh, here, let's try this. Um, I think this is unlikely to work, but we'll try it anyway. Let's try that. Uh, so we're, we're going to. So, so what's important about chat is it gives you it gives you this thing that looks like an SMS kind of chat window, and people can just take uh, Wolfram language code or graphics or whatever else and just run it. Um, uh, and put it into chat. This is useful if you're, if you're running a class or something. Every student can be on chat, and they can send you results that will arrive in your chat window. It's a very flexible thing. It can be one-to-one, -one, many to one one-to-many, et cetera. Um, and we have a, a chat system set up for this conference that people can play with. And I'm, I'm just going to rush forward here. Um, the, uh, uh, another thing that's, that's part of this, um, you can, you can trivially make, you can interact with chat programmatically, so you can make chat bots and so on. Um, another thing I might mention, in the cloud, collaborative editing will be coming rather soon, so that you can have multiple people all writing into the same notebook, uh, initially in different cells in the notebook. Um, another thing that will be coming in the cloud, so you can use chat across both desktop and cloud. And so we're building a thing we're calling, probably will be called planet-wide instant help, or might be called public help for our open cloud, where people who are using the open cloud can ask for help, and some, somebody who's volunteering can, uh, can offer them help through this chat mechanism. Um, another thing that's coming is SMS messaging directly from the language. Um, OK, let me show you a completely different thing. Uh, I'm really racing through a lot of things here. Let me show you a completely different piece of the world. This is sort of an external interaction now with blockchain. So this is showing, this is connecting to the Bitcoin blockchain. That's showing the current state. Let, let's look at the most recent block that went onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So there it is. Um, and those are the transactions that happened in the Bitcoin blockchain. Those are a bunch of transactions that just happened in the latest block added to the Bitcoin blockchain. That's a lot of transactions. Um, and then we could, for example, let's say, let's take 
the, um, of that Bitcoin blockchain. Let's get those transactions. Let's, uh, this was a big long list again. Um, and those are the, the hashes for the transactions. We could say, for example, let's get the actual data from one of those transactions. OK, so there it is. And we can see all the various operations that are going on here. Um, well, so that's on the, on the public uh, Bitcoin blockchain. We can now sort of symbolically do computations based on the, on the symbolic Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, we also have our own blockchain uh, running in our cloud. Um, and so this is now showing, this sh will show the, um, the uh, basic data on our blockchain. So we can just go ahead and say, let's put something into our blockchain. So let's put a picture of a circle into our blockchain. And there's the hash that comes back from that transaction. And now if I want to, I can say, get from our blockchain the thing at, based on that hash. And there's our circle back again. And so now if I wanted to, I can say, show me the transaction data from that transaction on our blockchain. And there's the result. And it's showing us all the various operations that were performed to put that data onto our blockchain and so on. So what, what we'll be doing is we have one version of the blockchain running in our cloud. Um, private clouds will also have blockchains capability. If you have multiple private clouds, you can distribute the blockchain across multiple private clouds. We'll also probably provide a kit for being able to distribute our blockchain to things that aren't necessarily even running private clouds. So this is a way of, of using blockchain capability for making ledgers and things like this. Um, actually, Wolfram Language is very well positioned to be sort of the language for smart contracts, um, not least because we have lots of data about the world that can tell you whether something has happened in the world. Um, but we're also we, we're able to express a lot of things in the world that need to be put in contracts. We're working towards one of my big projects is what I call symbolic discourse language, um, being able to express things about the world, all kinds of things about the world in a symbolic language so that you can write contracts not just in English, but in code. Um, and you'll be able to often take existing English language contracts and do natural language understanding, just like we do in Wolfram Alpha, and turn them into symbolic code that can then be executed automatically by machine. OK, so we want to express lots of kinds of things in Wolfram language. So one long time thing that I've been interested in, so that's kind of everyday stuff. Let's go from the everyday to the much more obscure. One thing I've been interested in is representing mathematics, higher mathematics and mathematical proofs. This is a page from the New Kind of Science book. Um, this is a, a part of the proof. I, I found the simplest axiom system for Boolean algebra about 20 years ago. That's part of the automated proof of that result. Um, well, we can go ahead and take we can now, uh, we'll be able to, in Morphin language, directly generate something that represents that proof. So here what I'm doing, I'm taking that little tiny axiom system for Boolean algebra, which I'm kind of proud of the fact that it is the simplest. You know, from the, nobody will ever find a simpler one because you can prove it's the simplest. And now what I'm doing here is I'm saying prove the commutativity of the NAND operator on the basis of that axiom system for Boolean algebra. And what I'll get here is this thing that represents the result of that um, represents that proof. And so we now, the issue is how do you represent a proof? So this is now a data set that represents, so there are 102 steps. These are various lemmas in the proof. And you can go ahead and look in more detail at each lemma here. This is representing all these proofs. So for example, we can say, show me the proof network here. And uh, there's a proof network that shows me how those lemmas are connected together, what lemma refers to what other lemma to prove things in the proof of that result. And we could also say, just show me something that will convince me that it's true. So this is now a, a pure function that uh, probably be formatted differently in the end. But this is a pure function which we can just take this thing. There's just a bunch of transformation rules. We can say, take that function, in this case, apply it to nothing. And boom, it says it's true. And that just verified that this proof is correct. You can go through and look at the pieces and see that it's just doing replacement rules to check that the proof is correct. So, that's a, one coming attraction is being able to do, uh, do proofs like this. One thing we've been doing is working with the uh, proof assistant system named Lean um, that is a, a way of representing, a uh, way of encoding formal uh, mathematical proofs. Um, and uh, the proofs can be more complicated than these equational ones. We're going to have a kind of unified format for representing these proofs. And you'll be able to interoperate between Lean and Wolfram Language and Mathematica and so on um, to do these computations. So. Uh, 
you know, when proofs are automated, the big challenge is that they can be very hard to understand. Uh, in Wolfram Alpha, we've made, put a lot of effort into making our show steps capabilities for students to understand how computations get done. But in general, when you have one of these big automated proofs, it's really hard to understand what on earth is actually happening. And one of the issues is that what you have to realize is that these lemmas, when you look at these lemmas, it's like you have no idea what the important, what the significance of this lemma is. There's no kind of human understandable sort of anchor that you have to think about these lemmas. Um, and the thing to realize is it's, it's very much like what happens in these AI systems and neural networks. You look at some intermediate piece of the neural net and you say, well, it's making an interesting distinction. And that might be a distinction that we could have had a word for, but we don't happen to have a word for it. And similarly here, this could be a famous lemma that was discovered by Euler, but it probably isn't. Um, it's instead just some lemma out there in the space of all possible lemmas. And so there's this kind of very social societal aspect to how you build things that are understandable um, in, uh, in one of these systems. So thinking about that gets us into the question of, OK, well, why don't we just take the three million theorems that have been published in the literature of mathematics and just curate them? Turns out there are about 10,000 named ones that have any reasonable frequency, and they follow about a Zipf's law distribution of frequencies. Um, but uh, so we're interested in kind of uh, um, uh, curating all those kinds of things. So for example, you'll find in the data repository some slightly unexpected formal kinds of things, like a general topology entity store, which has concepts and topology, and has kind of the network of how those concepts relate, and all those kinds of things. Uh, we're generally working towards being able to have a way to represent all kinds of pure mathematical constructs in the Wolfram language. So we might have an equality test right now, but to represent things in pure mathematics, we need things like asymptotically equal to. And we think we have about 6,000 primitives in Wolfram language right now. By adding another 1,000 to 1,500, we will be able to capture essentially all of useful uh, modern pure mathematics um, in uh, at least be able to represent the, the results there. OK, so in a, a slightly more... Um, uh, more basic form. Let's see if this works. Um, another area that we've been interested in is uh, more elementary mathematics is geometry. So this is kind of a, a sketch pad thing that we've had for a while that you'll probably see showing up um, as a more built-in feature of the language. But what's of more interest to us right now is being able to, um, to represent uh, uh, simple geometrical theorems. So here, oh, great. Um, well, that's no fun. The, this um, uh, humph. Well, I would have expected that to work. Okay, so this is a this is a coming attraction. This is a way of representing the uh, uh, the structure, representing kind of the setup in a geometrical theorem. So this is saying we've got geometrical points named A and B, and they're in a triangle, and there's a circle through these. And now what we can do, which probably won't work here. Um, is what might, oh yes, it did work, okay. So what that's doing now is it's taking those geometrical setups. This says a triangle ABC, there's a circle through A, B, and C um, around the point O. Uh, o is on the midpoint of the line A to C, okay? So then it says, okay, generate examples, generic examples that don't have any extra relations, but generic examples of that geometry, okay? So these are kind of like, show me examples that satisfy that setup. Okay, so then we can say, OK, well, given that, let's just take one of those and let's say, find me kind of facts based on that setup. Find me, find geometric conjectures based on this geometric setup. So it, in fact, discovers that the angle between those points is 90 degrees and so on. Or I could, for example, say, let's, let's generate as many of these as we can. Let's see what we get. OK, so here we have um, a couple of different results. Um, that can be illustrated here that come out from generating uh, from, the, um, uh, from the underlying geometric setup. Now, of course, it makes it a lot easier to do this, that we have very powerful algebraic computation capabilities underneath that allow us to know what's true at an algebraic level um, that we can then apply to this geometry. OK, another thing that's coming, um, oh gosh, lots of things coming in, in sort of the math area. Another one is closer integration with tech. Just like you can type control equals to do natural language, you'll have a similar way of being able to enter tech directly into notebooks and have it rendered there. Um, 
Uh, let's see. There's, there's another thing um, that's coming is numbers with uncertainty. This is another useful thing. So if we say we're not sure about the name around, we've been agonizing about this for a long time. But uh, it's around 12, but with an error of 0.14. So that's 12 plus or minus 0.4. I can take that to the fourth power. It will propagate the errors correctly. Uh, for example, if I do it symbolically, I can say mu plus or minus sigma. I could take, let's say, something like um, uh, the square root of that. I get a result. Um, I could say take uh, something with an asymmetric error. Um, I could compute with that. Things get much more complicated when you're dealing with correlated errors. This is something which didn't work in this case. Oh well. Um, okay. Wow. Well, that shows that it's complicated inside. Um, the uh, um, this is um, okay. So that's a symbolic uh, version of a second-order error computation um, uh, for a function f of mu. OK, so that's a um, talking of, uh, um, there's a, another thing that's happening in, is a sophisticated type system for our language where we'll be able to, it, it, it deeply integrated with our, with our uh, pattern system. Um, talking of abstract things, I'll just show one little abstract function that's kind of fun, which is the curry function. You know, this is a function that, in principle, we could have introduced 30 years ago, but I don't think anybody would have understood it 30 years ago. I think now, with sort of increased understanding of functional programming and ex increased experience with Wolfram language, this function actually starts to make sense. So if I say curry of f a, and then I apply that to b, it will give me f of b a. Why is that useful? Well, you can say something like curry partition 4, and that will give you kind of a function which, when applied to, uh, let's say, this, the alphabet, will make it partitioned in, in blocks of 4. OK, another sort of abstract thing that's coming is quantum computing framework. So this is a representation of a quantum discrete state. Um, we have a representation of a quantum circuit here. Obviously, we are merely simulating these quantum computations on a classical computer. I'm not sure quantum computers really actually exist, um, but we can still do all sorts of interesting formalism with them. And maybe we'll be able to connect to a quantum API if, if anybody actually lets, you know, delivers one that, that is real. But this is, uh, what's interesting here is that this is actually very similar in the way that it's structured with these quantum discrete operations to the way that we're structuring neural network computations and the same kind of evolution from this kind of things with wires to things with functional programming will, will happen here with, with quantum computing too. OK, talking of faster computation, which quantum computing may not ever deliver, but um, a, uh, a very big effort of ours that's been running for a long time, very important, is uh, uh, building a full compiler for Wolfram language. So let me show you a little bit about that. Um, so here I can, let's go there, hold on a second, let me go there. OK, so let me say, OK, so I'm going to, I have to tell it right now that I need the compiler. So now what I can do here is I can say compile this function. So this is a very simple function with a, this is showing a little bit of a type system. This is saying it's a, a typed lambda expression with type real 64, very low level type there. But now I can just take that thing and apply that compiled function to something and I'll get the result. Now, that all looks trivial, but here's where it starts to be non-trivial. This is compiling into LLVM, um, low-level virtual machine language. And so there's the LLVM code for that thing. And I can take that LLVM code and I can say, well, let, let's do a more non-trivial version. Let's, let's make the LLVM code for a table here. This will be probably a somewhat complicated piece of code. OK, so this is all kinds of low-level stuff with setting. Uh, pointers into registers and all kinds of all kinds of funky stuff. Okay, well that's that's all well and good. Let's do something else here. Let's let's load in some tools that we need now. Let's say let's turn that thing into assembly language. And so this is um, that is assembly language code that came from from Wolfram language code. We are directly generating assembly language through LLVM um, that you can then run. In fact, standalone. Um, in, uh, uh, on your machine. So there's, there's assembly language for those who can still read that stuff. Um, and uh, if you wanted to, let, let's be a little bit more exotic. Let's um, target it for Linux ARM instead of targeting it for x86, which is what this machine is. So there's the Linux ARM assembly code that you could run on a phone or something directly as a standalone program. So what we'll be doing is um, having a runtime library. So, so some of this will run pure standalone, completely compiled into machine code. Um, some of it will require a runtime library. We'll have a variety of runtime libraries that support different levels of capability. But what's important about this is it will run incredibly fast. So even if you write 
Uh, you know, one of the issues that's been the case in Morphem Language for a long time, if you write Fortran-like code in Morphem Language, it doesn't run particularly fast. It will now run blindingly fast. Um, and so we'll be able to, you know, when you, run, when you write code that really uses functional programming and uses a high-level construct, it already runs fast. But when you, uh, you will be able to run any kind of code at kind of machine code speed. And that means that we will actually be able to compile a lot of the things that we, a lot of Wolfram Language is now written in Wolfram Language itself. And all of Wolfram Alpha is written in Wolfram Language. So this compiler will allow us to make all of that a lot faster. So that's a, I think it's a pretty exciting thing that's coming. This will relate also to various kinds of standalone deployment mechanisms and the standalone microkernel that we're building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so lots of stuff going on. So one of the issues is always how to present this, how to deliver information about this. Something that's kind of unique to our language, I think, is that one can do interesting live coding. One can actually stand here and write code, have interesting things happen, and increasingly, uh, I think live coding is a great sort of way of communicating what's going on. Uh, one of the mechanisms that we've been using to, uh, uh, to communicate live coding is um, uh, we've been, let's see where I've got this, um, is we've been um, uh, using uh, a platform called Twitch, which is really, no, I do not need to sign up for the Twitch beta. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, uh, it's, it's a platform that was actually built for people watching people play video games, which is arguably is one of those human activities that if you'd gone back even 100 years and asked somebody whether people would ever be doing that, they would have said, no, that's not, that's not a conceivable thing that could have a purpose. But um, the world moves forward, and, and there are new purposes that emerge. Um, but in any case, we've been using Twitch um, as a platform for doing live coding. Um, and uh, I've, I've done it a bunch. I, my, approach is whenever I just have some random piece of code to write at some random time late at night or something, uh, if it's something I think might be of any interest to the outside world, I'll just start live streaming it on Twitch. Um, and so for example, I've been um, working on uh, making companion, companion notebooks for the NKS book, taking old code from 20 years ago and finding out that it still runs and cleaning it up and doing things with it. And I've been doing a bunch of that live on Twitch. Um, and I think it will be, uh, at the end of it, I'll have sort of the, the knowledge about how this code was made as well as, uh, as well as the actual code, because there'll be videos of it from Twitch. Another thing we just started doing, actually, a week or so ago, is something living very dangerously. We're kind of going into reality TV of some sort, um, which is we, we do, what I spend a lot of my time doing is design reviews, trying to figure out how should all this functionality that we're building in Wolfram Language actually work. Um, I think design reviews are a pretty interesting thing because they really, you have to really get to the heart of how some particular piece of functionality is going to work. I thought it'd be interesting. I think they're interesting. So I thought, what the heck, let's live stream some design reviews. So we've now had about three episodes. So you can, you can find out how those various decisions actually got made. Uh, I think there's one about mail searching. There's one about chemistry. And there's one about something else I now forget. Um, and. Uh, well, we're, uh, we like feedback on these things, but um, uh, we expect to continue doing it. It's a sort of an interesting way of presenting the process of designing uh, uh, Wolfram Language and, and designing software in general. It's kind of a um, uh, live stream design reviews. OK, well, as you can tell, we've got a very complicated set of things um, uh, going on. Big, big pipeline of R&D. Uh, we kind of pride ourselves on. Um, uh, on having clean design for, our, for the things we produce from our R&D. Uh, we also want to, we want to have clean design not only for the, our products, but also for our product line. Um, and we have this sort of beautifully unified setup across desktop and cloud and servers and embedded and so on, the thing we're calling our hyper-architecture. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and it's also, we want sort of actual things that people can use, whether they're open or community systems or real commercial products. They're all part of this hyper architecture. Uh, we'll really be emphasizing this kind of unification over the coming year. The first big step in this is what we call Wolfram One. Um, and uh, Wolfram One is kind of our, our on ramp into our whole technology stack. It goes across desktop and cloud, um, and uh, it's kind of our new base product. Uh, you can use it in the cloud. You can download a desktop version. Um, actually, soon there's going to be a, a new robust download manager, so it's easier to get that full download to happen. Um, and uh, so if you're doing sort of standard technical computing or mathy kinds of things, Mathematica is the right product. 
Um, and all the licensing of Mathematica is sort of optimized for that. For other things, including kind of data science, software development, machine learning, lots of emerging areas, Wolfram 1 is really the place to, to start. Um, with that because it's set up to be able to have data repositories and all kinds of other things that are, that are useful for that. Um, and then the idea is from Wolfram 1, that's sort of a seamless way to get to all parts of our hyper-architecture, whether you're using HPC or deploying private clouds, building up big enterprise systems and so on. It's kind of a seamless uh, thing that starts with Wolfram 1. So, and from this hyper-architecture, we're also going to be building up a lots of vertical products with interfaces optimized to particular workflows, um, where the whole thing is just defined by a little piece of Wolfram Language code. Actually, I think it's a sort of unique and fantastic opportunity with Wolfram Language um, that, uh, uh, that, that you can do all of this. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for people, probably including people here, to kind of build the first generation of verticalized products in a bunch of different areas. OK, so at the other end of the scale, from big enterprise verticalized products, um, there's uh, things we're doing with K through 12 education. Um, in general, we're doing a lot with teaching computational thinking. In fact, we have a specific product called Wolfram Programming Lab, uh, which is sort of optimized for, uh, for presentation there. And you know, it uh, turns out I have discovered that kids don't notice the subtle syntax coloring that we have. So it's brighter and, um, uh, and easier to notice there. And there are all kinds of other detailed changes like that that are made to deploy things in a, in a good way for kids. Um, but we have, we have this great opportunity with Wolfram Language with, to teach computational thinking because we've really automated the whole system to the point where kids can readily use it. And it's got all that knowledge already built into it, so one can immediately apply it to things that are actually interesting. It, it's not something where one th is thinking about using Wolfram Language as like, it's coding. It's really computational thinking. I mean, coding is a low-level sort of specific engineering activity that involves setting up loops and defining values for variables and things like this. Um, and it's something which, you know, there's a risk that people find coding as sort of boring as the more mechanical aspects of math. Um, I think what we can do with Wolfram Language is really let people do computational thinking, let them do interesting things immediately with computation. And so it, it's, uh, it's something that, um, that I'm very keen on. I've, I've often talked about the fact that for every field X of human endeavor from sort of, uh, I don't know, archaeology, agriculture to um, zoology or something, there either is now a computational X or soon will be. And that's going to be sort of the future of those fields. And that's the thing that people need to learn is this computational thinking that's relevant to all of these different computational X. And something goes all the way across the curriculum. It's not something that's a specific, oh, there's this computation component of the curriculum. It's something which should be part of the whole curriculum. Uh, computation should be something you do in language learning, language arts, or learning uh, all sorts of other kinds of things. So one of the things that's interesting is there's sort of a new form of output for, for students, which is what I call computational essays. Um, and uh, let's see, the, um, here's an example, I hope. Let's see if I can bring this up. Um, here's an example of, uh, so, so the idea of a computational essay is um, that uh, um, uh, it's just a way of, um, here we go, here's a typical computational essay that I, Oh, this is just a draft of one that I wrote. So the idea is there's a little piece of text. It's very much like uh, we've been writing things about even from the first Mathematica book, and certainly now in my elementary introduction, it's like this little piece of text that explains something. Then it sort of operates as a dialogue between you and the computer of, OK, here's the thing that's going to happen. Here's, what the, here's the piece of code. Here's what happens, and so on. You go through and you build up some concept through this computational essay. And I think this is a great. Uh, form of output from students and so on, trying to you know express their understanding of something. Um, it's kind of the it's like well you could write an English essay, but you can also write a computational essay. The computational essay uh, it, it has a lot more leverage. You can do a lot more original things here because you're you're sort of collaborating with the computer and getting it done. Actually, it's sort of interesting. Um, so, uh, and, and these are just notebooks. We have one new style that helps support a code text style that helps support these kinds of things. So these are great for kids. They're also computational essays are a great way to explain things in general. Actually, our plan is to make, oh, you, you can deploy these things to the web. Our plan is to make a big encyclopedia of, um, uh, um, of 
of computational essays, kind of explorations of topics uh, of all different kinds of things. And these will be deployed on the web in such a way that you can not only read them, but also actually interact with them in our open cloud. Um, and so the idea is um, that you know, we've got 11,000 demonstrations. We hope we will have at least as many topic explorations. I hope people here um, will be able to contribute to that. Um, I think we have a... Um, uh, a place where you can submit. There's a description of how to write a topic exploration, and you can submit it directly in the cloud here. Um, and the idea is to make a big uh, sort of giant encyclopedia of topic explorations about everything one might be interested in. So uh, we um, um, yeah, it's one of the things that's interesting about computational essays as, a, as a something for kids is one thing about a computational essay is it's actually useful even a long time after you wrote it. That is, uh, you know, back 100 years or something ago, when kids learned math, they did it by writing these so-called ciphering books where they would, over a course of years, write out kind of examples of solutions to particular kinds of math problems that might occur in later life. And then they would keep these ciphering books as kind of a reference for how do you do percentage increase or, or whatever else. Um, well, most of what people do in school these days, they kind of just do it as an exercise and that's gone. But these computational essays, if you wrote something out that you understood at some point and you keep it, you'll be able to run that code many years from now um, and, uh, and have it be a useful reference for the future. So I think that's sort of an interesting extra feature of computational essays. Um, so beyond computational essays, another sort of thing is being able to produce courses. We have Wolfram U that we've been rolling out. That's uh, kind of us producing courses about all kinds of different things. We are looking forward to contributions from people. Um, here's kind of an example of how some of these courses work. This is one based on my uh, elementary introduction to Wolfram language. There's a video. There's text here. Um, there's also, if I can figure out how to do it, there is also, um, oh yeah, try a section which actually has some content. Um, the, uh, okay, that's not good, but um, uh, anyway, we, we can, um, uh, here you can enter, um, this is probably the worst section to try of all, but let's try, let's try a different section here. Um, the, uh, uh, so this is um, a, uh, uh, these are exercises here, and then we can say what's the expected output from that exercise, or we can say click to enter code, um, and then we get uh, a, um, a place where we can enter code, and we have a pretty sophisticated auto-grading system, which will uh, try and figure out whether the piece of code that you entered is correct. I don't know what's going wrong here. This is probably still some test version. Um, but anyway, this gives some sense of what's happening. We have a bunch of tools for making these videos um, and tools for setting up this whole, uh, whole framework here for, for building courses, and I encourage people to look at doing that. Um, there's uh, uh, Wolfram Media, our publishing operation, is publishing general interest educational material, both in book form and in the form of and in online forms like this. So, um, uh, let's see. The I think um, there's always a question. You know, modern computational thinking is something I think is sort of critical to teach. It's sort of a question of what the curriculum should look like. People keep on asking me this. And um, I, I probably will actually end up writing out a fairly detailed uh, kind of curriculum, and which may turn into sort of a book about sort of concepts and applications of modern computation that tries to, tries to address this. So a lot more that we're doing in, in, uh, in education. In K through 12, we have a thing we're calling our Computational Thinking Initiatives, CTI. We've had our very successful CBM initiative that started with, with math education and that's uh, steaming forward. We have some other angles as well. We've had our summer school that is sort of primarily for um, adults. And um, we've also had uh, um, um, our summer school consists of people make all sorts of interesting projects. Um, this might be, you know what, I think this web browser is becoming extremely bloated. I think that is our problem here. Um, look at that. Look at all those tabs. Uh, I, think, um, I think that's, um, uh, let's bring this thing back to life. Um, Let's say, oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, let's say, uh, um, okay, let's see. There, maybe this is a Tumblr from this. Let's see, this, this, should, this should bring up just examples of projects that were done at our summer school, I hope. Uh, waiting for, okay, there we go. There's just a bunch of, bunch of projects. 
There are tons and tons of these. They're kind of interesting to see. Um, but uh, uh, we both had this summer, summer school for adults and also our summer camp uh, for high school kids. Oh, don't tell me the network has failed again. Um, that's just weird. Um, in any case, the, um, OK. Uh, and we can see some of the projects that have been done by those, those kids, I hope. Um, but in any case, one of the things we're trying to do is to take that sort of two-week experience of going from zero to being able to do a non-trivial uh, computational thinking project and package it in a variety of different ways. Um, and we're sort of building what we uh, are calling our AI league clubs and a kind of AI art and science fair as a way of presenting these things. Why does it say it can't be reached? This is Tumblr, should be able to be reached. Anyway, there, there's some examples from our current summer school. The goal is to widely be able to let um, kids learn how to do stuff like this. And there are all sorts of fun and interesting opportunities around that. Um, another thing we're doing, small thing we're doing, is um, uh, our challenges website. This isn't quite ready, but it will be soon. Um, these are Wolfram language challenges that you can do, and there are leaderboards and so on for them. Um, something that's uh, kind of uh, um, interesting around, around Wolfram language. OK, so uh, finally, um, yeah, it sort of brings me to, to our big challenge, which is, OK, we're doing all this stuff. And we've got um, all these different things that we've been building in our technology stack. Um, how do we communicate everything that we have? Um, how do we really uh, make sure that everyone who should be using what we have actually is? I have to say that it's, it's, for me, it's quite frustrating as I sort of travel around. I hear the same thing all the time, which is, you guys have all this amazing stuff. Uh, how come more people aren't using it? Well, you can't always tell who's using it. There are actually plenty of people using our technology stack um, increasingly in large-scale production environments where you actually don't know what's underneath this large-scale production environment. But there clearly should be and could be uh, orders of magnitude more usage of, of what we built. And our sort of goal is to, to we've, we've built out a lot in the last few years, kind of our deployment capabilities, so that you can take this core world from language technology and deploy it across all these different environments. That's kind of one step. The other step is actually uh, making sure that people really internalize and understand how they can make use of what we have. And you guys here are kind of the vanguard of that, some of you for many years, uh, some of you just recently. Um, but you know, our challenge is sort of get the word out better. Um, and uh, of course, there are lots of opportunities that come with our technology stack, building a product based on our technology, starting a company, building a new field of research. I mean, one day, eventually, what we have here will be quite ubiquitous, and all of the stuff we've done with knowledge-based computation will be taken for granted. It'll be just a layer that gets taken for granted. But right now, a lot of what we can do kind of looks to most people like magic. I mean, you guys sort of understand the magic, and you know, the, the message is make use of it. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of what we built with Wolfram Language and everything around it. Um, but to realize that potential really needs the help of lots of people, including, including uh, people here. So I, I, mean, I know many of you are already involved in doing lots of things with our technology, and, and thank you for that. Um, but there's also a lot more to do, and I hope you will choose to, to get involved. I mean, I, I think, um, uh, actually, I think we had, um, let's see, a survey of di about different, um, uh, different ways that we know of that, um, that people can get involved with, with things that we're doing. Um, I think what we're doing is pretty important. I mean, I think computation is kind of uh, the great new paradigm of our times. And uh, you know, we've been lucky enough to build what I think is kind of the definitive technology stack that lets computation really achieve its potential um, in the world. And now we have to really get that technology stack deployed everywhere it can be um, and to actually do what I think should happen and to make it this kind of ubiquitous layer in the technology world. Um, I think when this has happened, it's going to be seen as a quite historic thing um, that has occurred over the course of, of the years in which it occurs. Um, and you know, I hope, I hope as many of you as possible will, will um, uh, choose to, to be involved. It's kind of fun being involved in historic kinds of things. And um, I think we've, we've got one of these that's kind of right on the cusp um, of, uh, uh, of, of being 
very uh, ubiquitous and important. So I encourage you to be there. And I should wrap up now. And I'm sorry I've gone for such a long time. I had, uh, as you could tell, I had a fair amount to talk about. Thanks very much.